So the previous lesson introduced the concept of the implied trusts. We took a basic introduction to what an implied trust is by its very nature, and, and it's, it's not particularly difficult to understand given the title of, of, of the topic. We're talking about trusts which are implied, they're not express. And then we also spent a little bit of time just overviewing, quite briefly overviewing, the nature of the two main types of implied trust that we are going to be examining in this chapter. Talking first about the concept of the resulting trust on the one hand, and then secondly talking about the quite convoluted and deliberately vague uh, uh, the trust on the other, the idea of the constructive trust. We also noted that there were two main types of resulting trusts. We noted that they are resulting trusts which may be on the one hand automatic and then resulting trusts on the other hand that may be presumptive or presumed. This lesson is going to talk about the first of these topics, talking about the concept of the uh, automatic resulting trust, trusts which are automatic in nature. What does that even mean? What does it mean, automatic resulting trusts? Um, uh, we'll talk about the law and consider the law that pertains to this particular area. Um, these require a great number of qualifications, uh, most of which we will get to in the discussion of these in these lessons. And what I mean by this is there's a lot of sort of uh, building up that needs to be thought about in relation to and a lot of requirements that are necessary in relation to the creation of such types of resulting trusts. So let's begin then. The automatic resulting trust, the nature of such an instrument, is that they will exist in law despite the actions and the intentions of the parties in reality, fundamentally. So the actions and the intentions of parties could be completely in contravention to that of what the law essentially exists to achieve. And so as a result of which the automatic resulting trust will exist in law despite these actions. So even if there is not this intention for a trust to exist, even if the parties don't want there to be a trust, or the intention to have a different trust elsewhere, this will not rebute the idea of the automatic resulting trust, the automatic existence of a resulting trust, if the law so requires it to do so, and if equity so requires it to do so. So this then asks and begs the question fundamentally then, where does an, uh, a resulting trust that is automatic of this nature, where will it arise? In what circumstances will it arise? Well, there are quite a few um, circumstances uh, fundamentally, but we will discuss some of them here. Okay, so There might be the existence of an automatic resulting trust in circumstances where there might not be a certainty of objects. That is a first requirement or maybe a first circumstance. There might be an automatic resulting trust under the basis of some kind of conditionality. Um, thirdly, there could be a lack of purpose, which gives rise to an automatic resulting trust. Let's take these three examples, these three examples of, of, of the circumstances in which there may arise the existence of an automatic resulting trust and talk about how this operates. And it is with these examples that you will get a better understanding of how the automatic resulting trust arises, um, just by simple reference to these um, case studies, if you will, to these examples. So the first one is that there may not be a certainty of objects. Uh, the certainty of objects and the beneficiary principle, as you know, and as we've spoken about early on in this series of lessons, but then also towards the end of this series of lessons, looking at, uh, looking at purpose trusts, these are two of the major cornerstones in the subject of trust. Remember back to a previous case where uh, one of the uh, Lord Justices spoke about how it is a cornerstone or a basic fact of English law of trusts that a trust would have a beneficiary that is either ascertainable or has been ascertained. If there is, however, a failure to clearly specify the existence of a beneficiary in accordance with the basic beneficiary principle, then what this therefore means is that the trust becomes void. It becomes uh, unable to be enforceable because there is no beneficiary. However, in response to this, and owing to the equitable maxim that, quote, equity abhors a vacuum, Something needs to be done about the beneficial interest, which was supposedly held on trust. Remember here, what we have 
is if there is a failure to adhere to the beneficiary principle, there is at the very least an intention on the part of the parties to create some kind of trust, but they have failed to create the trust to the standards of which a trust is valid in English law, which is obviously in a conjunction with the beneficiary principle and the certainty of objects. So the result here is that you still have property that you want to put on trust and you still have some kind of beneficial interest and you still have something there, but you may not have a beneficiary. So while you may not have an express trust in that regard and that that, that trust is therefore void, um, you may still nevertheless have to think about and deal with the fact that you have property that you have um, supposedly given to and held on trust to a beneficial interest. And so... In conjunction with the principle that equity abhors a vacuum, something needs to be done about this beneficial interest. Something needs to be done about this vacuum that has been created owing to the fact that no trust has arisen. Well, in such circumstances as these, where there is a transfer of property, but there is no certainty of objects, there is no beneficiary principle, the property is then therefore held on automatic resulting trust for the settler. The settler then becomes the beneficiary of this automatic resulting trust, given the fact that there has been a transfer of that property to the trustee, but that because there is no beneficiary, at least in the original trust, in the, in the, in the trust that was attempted to be created, then the automatic resulting trust creates a beneficiary, the beneficiary, of course, being the settler. A second circumstance in which an automatic resulting trust may arise is through this idea of conditionality. Sometimes it might be the case that a trust places conditions on the beneficiaries. Okay, so for example, uh, if someone is born, uh, you, uh, if someone is born, people might come together and uh, and say, "Right, well, what we're going to do is we're going to create a trust um, for this child, uh, and we're going to put money in it every month or so or whatever, and it will build up and it'll be a little trust fund for them, such that when they come of age, they can benefit from that property. And that might be the age of eighteen, that might be the age of fifteen, it might be whatever, and it might even or it might even be for a particular purpose. It might be for um, that person to that when they get to 18 it can help them uh, uh, when it comes to buying a car or it could be for the reasons of going to university or something like that something to help them in life okay this here is placing a condition on the beneficiary however suggesting that you must reach a certain age before you're able to benefit from that property what happens therefore in the circumstances where they fail to meet this condition Heaven forbid you have a trust set up that lead that is building in property over over many years for the child that's just been born, and the requirement is that they reach the age of eighteen. But tragically and quite horrifically, they never make it to the age of eighteen. What if they fail to meet the condition? What if they die before they before their eighteenth birthday? Well, in that circumstance, you again have a vacuum. You have a situation here where you have a trust that has been that has been created, but there is no ability. For the beneficiary to benefit from that property because in order to do so they had to meet a, met a certain condition and that condition had not been met so what happens well again a resulting trust then will resolve this vacuum creating a trust instrument for the settler again in a similar sense to the previous example and it's very similar to the previous example really in the sense that there is not a clearly identifiable beneficiary in the First example, this is in the creation of a trust where there just isn't a beneficiary or there just isn't a certainty of objects. In this case, there is a certainty of objects, but there is a condition placed on that uh, beneficiary in order for them to benefit from the property and they don't meet that benefit. So at the point at which that condition elapses, if you will, at the point at which that condition has been met, there is no beneficiary. Given the fact that if, let's say, we have a trust that is set up for uh, a, a kid that's going to um, benefit from this property when they turn 18 they think we have a certainty of objects there that's a perfectly valid trust it's a perfectly valid trust fund but if and when they get to that point they actually haven't made it to the age of 18 unfortunately uh, then when we get to the point at which that condition is, expires at the point at which they reach 18 there is no person there to benefit from that property because they have died so this is really where we get the resolution of the va of, of the vacuum that exists um that obviously uh, owing to the principle that equity abhors a vacuum 
Finally then, a, an automatic resulting trust can arise out of a lack of purpose. If money is given to a person on the condition of a particular purpose, so for example, um, uh, you know, uh, money is to be used for this purpose, I'm giving you money for this particular purpose, but this purpose is unable to be carried out for whatever reason, then there is the assumption that an automatic resulting trust is therefore created and the property, i.e. the money um, for which that purpose was created for, um, is then placed on trust for the original donor. This is essentially what happened in the case of, uh, of Barclays Bank um, versus Quisclose Investments, if you remember. The uh, Quisclose Investments Limited essentially um, uh, uh, gave a loan to, uh, this, um, th to this third party corporation for the payment of dividends to shareholders. And of course, they were unable to do so. Um, because they went into insolvent liquidation. And the dispute around the specific Quist Close Trust obviously arose when it came to whether or not Barclays Bank could use that money that was um, that, that was lended by this investments firm um, to essentially pay off creditors in the event of insolvent liquidation. But fundamentally, this was a um, a trust that was created, or it was a it was a donation or a, a loan that was given for a particular purpose, and that purpose was failed uh, to be adhered to. Generally, here the courts will focus on what the mutual intention of the parties was in relation to the donation of that money. So there could, for example, arise circumstances in which there might be a dispute as to what the intention of that money um, is. Um, but where it is clear um, and where the courts will find um, clarity in the mutual in the in the purpose of the money donation will be in the mutual intention of those parties.